In this video, we want to discuss the concept of language, specifically where it intersects with effective listening, how language impacts and, and really enhances our ability to listen effectively. Now, as you've been following along, you know, we're using the, the hurrier model of listening to, to kind of explore listening, the H U R I E R, which of course stands for hearing, understanding, remembering, interpreting, evaluating, and responding. We are squarely right now in the understanding component of the hurrier model. So that's where we're placing language is, uh, you know, in our ability to really understand what the other person is saying and, and as, as a, an effort to make meaning out of that. So when we look at this in the, in the placement of the hurrier model in a graphic sense, you can see that we started with hearing. Now we're in that in the midst of that understanding, interpreting, evaluating part where we are uh, processing what we are hearing, trying to make meaning of it and decipher what the meaning is behind what that person is saying, which starts really with understanding the ability to, to understand what they are saying. So as we've, uh, as we look at understanding, we've uh, mentioned before that we're going to look at it in the context, in, in the context of language, context, and intention, those, those variables that really play into understanding. So again, in this video, we're going to take a look at, at where that falls in the hurrier model and the understanding area and specifically at language then. So when we think about language and listening uh, and understanding language, first of all, we need to understand that language is symbolic. Language is not magical. It doesn't hold special powers or anything like that. It wasn't handed down from on high. Language is this, is this thing that was created by people over centuries and centuries and it continues to evolve, but it really just represents something else. It's very much like the flag. If we think about the flag of the United States or of any nation, you know, what is the flag really? Well, in a literal sense, it's fabric, right? That's arranged in particular ways and the colors are, are sorted in a particular way and it has different, you know, imagery on it. It's really just pieces of fabric though, right? That are, that are arranged in that particular way. But the flag represents a great deal more for people here in the United States. It represents freedom and uh, represents the ability to, to, to kind of live our lives the way we want to, right? Within certain bounds and so forth. So the flag has great symbolic meaning to us. Well, language is the same way. The language is, is just, just randomly thrown together symbols, that, you know, collections of letters, which are really symbols themselves into ways that are arranged in particular ways that we've agreed. We understand we have the shared meaning of what they mean, but they're really just symbolic. So remember that language is symbolic. It represents something else. Remember also that language is arbitrary. As we, as we just said, it's not handed down from on high. For the most part, language is just randomly put together in a way that somebody has decided that why, why is, why do we call this, uh, this animal a cow? Why do we refer to it as a cow? I don't know. Somebody at some point decided that's what it was going to be called. It probably evolved from some different language and, and, but eventually we just all, you know, those of us who speak English and especially in the United States, we've just determined that when you see this animal, it's a cow. Now there's specific breeds and different things like that, that differentiate different cows. But, but you know, most of us, when we look at this, we just say cow, it doesn't, sound like a cow, right? Well, the word cow doesn't sound like what, what it represents here or have anything to do really. It's just an arbitrary collection of letters that represents this idea. Now there are occasions where you have words that aren't as arbitrary, like what does the cow say? Well, for, for where I grew up, the cow says moo, moo, right? Now moo is what we call an onomatopoeia. Now that's not arbitrary. It's intended to sound like the thing that it, that it represents. So the word moo, and we say moo, and the moo is intended to sound like what it sounds like. You know, there's other things you see on these old Batman shows too, like boom and splash and bang and pop. And those types of things are onomatopoeia. They're intended to, to sound like, and the thing that they represent. But the vast, vast majority of language is not that. It is just arbitrarily put together. It's just a random collection. It only has meaning because we give it meaning. Uh, and because of that, and, and as, a, as an extension of that, language is subjective. Language is subjective, meaning it can have multiple interpretations um, depending on who you ask about a particular word. So now language is, uh, it does have two types of meanings. The first is what we call denotative meaning which is pretty much the same for everybody. It's what we would call the dictionary meaning. If we looked up that word in the dictionary, what would we find? And, uh, and so we do have this kind of collective shared understanding of what a word means through the denotative meaning, but every word also has 
what's called the connotative meaning, which is more subjective. It's individualized to that person. What does that mean? And to kind of represent this, we have what we call Ogden and Richards semantic triangle. This is one way of representing the idea of the different meanings of words. And they said the Ogden and Richards came up with this, this kind of framework that said, well, there are really three, every word has three different representations. So let's take a look at that. First, we have the word home, for example, this is the symbol itself. It's that random collection of letters, H O M E. And when we put them together, they, they spell this word and they pronounce it's pronounced this particular way. And it has a particular meaning, right? A connotative meaning and a denotative meaning. So the denotative meaning, the dictionary definition of the word home, if we looked it up in the dictionary, we would see that it's a structure, right? It's a building that has walls and a door and probably windows and things, at least in the United States, this is a fairly the stereotypical home, what we would think of as a home. That's the denotative meaning. Again, if we looked it up in the dictionary, so no matter who you ask, if you said, is this a home? You, they would probably say, yeah, it's a place where it's a dwelling. It's a place where people live, right? But some people, when you say home are going to think, you know, their, their connotative meaning is going to take them to a meaning of home is where the heart is. Home is where my family is. Home is this pleasant place. It's, it's wonderful. It's safe. It's warm. It's where my food is. It's just all the good things in life, right? Are my home. So, um, so the so home has this really pleasant connotation for them, this positive connotation for them. But if we also, we could take that same word home, have the same collection of letters, spelled the same way, have the same denotative meaning, right? The same um, <clears throat> kind of dictionary meaning for that word, the same denotative meaning. We looked it up it would be this, you know, the structure is residence where people live. But for some people, when they think of home, it's not that pleasant, lovely, warm space. It's a place where there's argument and there's, there's confrontation and there's fighting and there's, you know, all kinds of bad things. So maybe home isn't such a pleasant place. So you could say home to one person and it brings up all these warm and fuzzy feelings. You say it to somebody else, it brings up all these other types of feelings, these negative kind of connotative feelings. So we need to remember that every word has both a denotative meaning and a connotative meaning. So as listeners, we need to understand that just because we associate a particular meaning with a word may not be the way that that, that person is using it when they say it, when they speak it. So we have to really kind of try and interpret you know, what does this person mean by using that word in particular or that, you know, over, over a different word or what are they, what meaning do they attach to that particular word? Um, so language takes on a, a different experience in listening because of that. You know, one other example we could use if we said baseball, it's this collection of letters, right? And it's, that's what it is. If we looked it up in the dictionary, we would find that it's a, that's a, the, a, the ball itself is a baseball. It would have a description there of the ball and would also have a description of the game with one player at, at bat and nine in the field and so forth. Right. And that's what, you know, regardless of whatever else you think of baseball, that's what baseball is. Denotatively, that's what baseball is. That's the dictionary definition. But if we were to ask, you know, everybody who happens to watch this video, what do you think of with baseball? What does it bring up for you? We're going to get all kinds of different answers, right? We're going to get people, first of all, who love baseball, people who can't stand baseball, people who don't really care baseball about baseball, people who don't know what it is maybe at all. You're going to get people who think about, you know, baseball as playing it when they were a kid or going to the ballpark with their family or going to the, going to watch games at a major league park or going to, the, to watch their kids play baseball. We're going to get all kinds of, of connotative meaning and definition connected to that word baseball. So again, as a listener, I need to determine, okay, what is this person? Not only what does this word mean to me, but what is this person uh, that's saying this? What does it mean to them? What's their you know, connotative connection to this word? And why did they choose that over other words? Or, you know, why did they use that word for me regard rather than other things? And so all kinds of things we need to pay attention to with, with language in terms of meaning and understanding that language is subjective. Um, Language is also, it's important to remember that it's bound by context and culture. A word may mean one thing in one context and a different thing in another, or the same with, with culture may, may be appropriate in one culture and not in another. And that these things are, are in particular created by and specific to a particular culture and they are time bound as well. Um, to that. So for example, if we look at these words, pop slang from the two thousands, most of these are words we don't use anymore. They were very popular in that, you know, 2010 to 2010 or sorry, 2000 to 2010 era in the early two thousands. But you know, words come and go. English is a living language. We use words for a while and then they fall out of favor. Some of them stick around, but most words, a lot of words will go away over time. And so um, if you continue using the same word, it's going to really date you because it's really bound to that particular context and that particular culture. 
So we need to be aware of that, that language changes from context and culture, be aware of who our audience is, who, who is speaking to us as listeners. Again, what words are they using? How does that affect the way that, that we understand them, our ability to understand people, how they're using culture and context, or are they using words appropriately in those terms? So you can see that language has a lot to do with listening. Language isn't just about, you know, looking things up in a dictionary. It has a lot to do with subjective meaning, has a lot to do with the culture and context in which that word is used. So we need to be aware of that as listeners and also be aware of that as, as senders of communication, that the people who are listening to us may have uh, difficulty understanding if we, if we aren't using language that connects with them. And as a listener, we really have to be able to have that shared language and understood language with the person who's speaking. Otherwise, we're going to have a very hard time listening. It's hard to pay attention when you don't really understand what that person is saying, right? Or don't have a real connection to the words that they're using. If you have questions about the intersection of language and listening or anything else related to listening, please feel free to, to shoot me an email. Love to hear from you there. Otherwise, I, I in the meantime, I hope you will um, really deeply consider the impact of language on listeners, both as you as a listener and others who are listening, <coughs> excuse me, to you and, uh, and just uh, really um, work to relate to the idea that language has a large role to play in the way that we understand things as listeners. <laughs>